This morning we're concluding a three-part series of faith. And only the Lord knows timing of everything and how He chooses to unfold things. But I honestly can't think of a better way uh, to finish out a series on faith uh, than this morning. Than to be able to recognize and to see that there are those that are among us that are walking out their faith in profound ways. Joan was one of those people that lived her life in a way where she was curious about the Lord. We talked about that last week. We talked about the curiosity of a child and, and coming in a, with a posture of purity before God. But one of those characteristics is what it means to still be curious and still be wondering about God and how God welcomes that. I can think of many times in Bible studies through the years with Joan that she would ask really great questions and really difficult questions, wanting to know the truth of God and asking others around her to help her understand the Scriptures at a whole different level. I think of how we talked the very first week about what it looks like to put faith to our feet and to actually do something. And, and we talked about how Peter got out of the boat. He did something about his faith and he went to Jesus that was walking on the water, but, but He and He alone is the one that was in the boat that decided to go out and, and to, to climb out of the boat and, and to walk on water. And I have seen how Joan has had feet to her faith over the years as she has served so faithfully here at the church. We've talked about it before, but it's worth mentioning again, both Joan and Jean have been the backbone of the, the infrastructure of how the church runs for 16 years. Since our very first day as a congregation, they have made sure that the, the happenings of the church and all of the, the wheels turning behind the scenes have gone without error. Her diligence and her faith and her trust in God and her doing the very best she could to, to take step after step in following Christ and, and being curious about Jesus and, and curious about God and, and walking out this faith is a beautiful example of what it looks like for us to be able to, to emulate and to be able to say, I have seen a saint among us. I have seen someone that, that is walking out their faith in a very profound way. Scripture is full of example after example after example. From Genesis to Revelation, God has chosen to un, un, uh, reveal who He is. To pull the veil, if you will, from our eyes of the natural and give us a glimpse into the supernatural, but He's, he's decided to reveal who He is through the story of men and women that have gone before us. Sometimes they've succeeded and sometimes they've been valiant and sometimes the stories turn out where the individual puts their faith in God and, and trusts God. And sometimes it gives example of how it doesn't work out that way. Where a man or a woman decides to do their own thing, to go their own path, to forge their own way forward and how it ends up in disaster in misery, in despair, in brokenness. There's two types of people. There's those that can learn from those that have gone before. Can learn from others' mistakes and can learn from others' successes. And there are those that need to experience life themselves. And without a show of hands in here, I won't, I won't ask you to to reveal which one you lean more towards. If you're one that says, you know what, somebody could tell me that this is the right thing to do. I could watch them do it and see that they're successful by doing it this way. But until I do it myself, then I'm just not going to believe it or I'm not going to follow it. We talked the first week about faith and what it looks like 
for faith to live in your feet and not your feelings. Because feelings come and go. And, and just like Peter, Peter getting out of the boat, he was very quickly overcome by fear. The feeling of fear. But if faith, faith, faith lives in our feet, then we are sure-footed. Then we are on solid ground. Last week we talked about how faith lives in our hearts. And so we walked through the faith of a child. Today I want to think about what it would look like for faith to be a decision point for us. Faith to be a, a, a point of decision, a fork in the road, if you will, in which we need to engage in and make a decision about that we want to be people of faith. Dave read the Scripture from Genesis 22, and he noted that it's maybe one of the most difficult Scriptures to read. Abraham is known as kind of the father of our faith. And there's a reason why. There's, there's a reason why because Abraham, like we have unpacked over the last couple weeks, shows an extreme example, an extreme model of what it looks like to be open to hearing the voice of God. God calls out in Genesis 22, Abraham. And Abraham quickly responds, here I am. Here I am. We've talked about how the very first step in faith is being open to living a life of faith. And, and open to living a life of faith means that we have to have ears that are always attentive to the voice of God and what God might be doing and when God might be calling us to do something extraordinary. God is always talking to us. He's either talking to us through His Word, He's talking to us through prayer, through other people. God wants to continue to invite us to have our roots grow deeper and deeper with Him that we might live a life of more maturity and intimacy with our Creator. The question isn't, is God speaking? The question is, are our hearts and our ears open to hearing His voice and receptive to what He might be calling us to? It is so easy to get lulled into a life rhythm of complacency and comfort. The God that I know in the Bible and the God that I serve continuously calls us out of places of comfort. God continuously calls us out of places of routine and He will shake things up if we only allow Him to. If our ears and our eyes and our hearts and our feet are open to being used by Him and directed by Him, then there is nothing that God won't and can't do through the life of a believer that is completely surrendered to Him. God is looking for individuals that He can use to have profound impact upon the community and the world that we live in. Abraham had an uncommon faith in God. Last week, I talked about how it is right for us when we hear a word from God to be able to weigh that word. And one of the ways that we do that is by soliciting other people around us that we believe are hearing from the Lord so they can then confirm that what we're hearing is accurate. Because sometimes I can think all sorts of things. And I need to know, is this in alignment with what God is doing in my life? Or am I, just, am I just off about this? Now, right on the heels of me saying that, this example of Abraham in Genesis 22, Abraham doesn't convene a bunch of people. As a matter of fact, this story is a little bit scary because Abraham simply acts on, on faith that he is hearing God so accurately 
so succinctly that he doesn't delay at all. As a matter of fact, through the story, and just, just to set this up even more, just to, to remind us of this story, Abraham was over a hundred years old when this happened. Just a few chapters earlier, we read about how God tells him that he and his wife Sarah were going to have a son in their very old age. As a matter of fact, it says that Sarah laughed, right? She laughed at the idea because she was like 90 years old that God would show up. And so God sets the stage of this miracle that's Isaac. And so Isaac at this point is at least like, you know, 8 to 10, maybe even 12 to 14, I've read in some places. So he's not like just a baby at this point in Genesis 22. He's already been weaned. There's been some, some years that have passed since Isaac was born. And, and so Abraham was well into his hundreds. And here this, this miracle happened where Sarah was able to give birth to him at 90 years old. And so then, then the weight of God asking Abraham to sacrifice not only his only son, but it was clear evidence that this son was an absolute miracle. And so, ever, I mean, all sorts of bells and whistles should have been going on in Abraham's mind because it seems contradictory to the miracle of Isaac's birth that then God would say, I want you to sacrifice your son to me. But Abraham was so confident that he knew the voice of God that when God called Abraham, he immediately replied, Here am I, Lord. I am here. And by him saying, I am here, he was implying, God, I am available. God, you have called my name and I realize that there might be something that you're asking me to do on the heels of you alerting me. And so God, here I am. I am available to you. And so then God goes through the instruction and tells him what to do. And Abraham, without arguing, without delaying, he immediately trusts God and he obeys what God has called him to do. Some months back, I felt like I was beginning to, to hear the voice of God in a very succinct way that He was calling me to leave the mission. After 15 years of being at the mission, I felt like God was, was doing something different. But me, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. And so I immediately talked to Pastor Dave, and I'm like, this is going to sound crazy. What's, you know, here's what's kind of going on. And then we bring the elders into the conversation and I, I walk through this journey of, of trying to understand, Lord, is this what you're doing? But even in the midst of this, over months of trying to discern, God, is this what you're doing? Are you calling me out? God, I know that you called me to the mission. Are you now calling me out to something else? Even in the midst of this, I was still trying to wheel and deal with God. I was still trying to, to figure out and, and say, well, you know, God, I, I know that you've, you've pressed upon my heart that, that this is kind of when this would happen. But Lord, if I just stayed an extra three months, or God, if I just stayed an extra six months, or God, if I just stayed an extra year, then I'd be able to pay off this bill, and I'd be able to do this, and oh, I can take some FMLA for this, and I have so much sick time that I'll lose, Lord. Like, that doesn't make sense. So what if I take all this sick time, and what if I... God just brought all of that noise and all of my trying to, to argue with him or wrestle with him, or, and he brought it all back. And he said, this is what I've called you to do, and this is the time frame that I've called you to do it. And so at that point, it became very, very simple. I believed that what I had received from God and was verified through the elders and the leaders of the church, the very best we knew, completely unified, I said, God, I'm going to step out. I'm going to trust in you, even though I don't know exactly like it's going to unfold. I don't know exactly what step number two or step number three is going to be. But God, my family wants to live our lives in a way that we are hearing your voice. 
and we're trusting in you and we're stepping out the very best we know in faith that you are going to provide. One of the things that I love about this scripture is even when Abraham is so obedient and and just timely about following God to, to what he had heard, even when he gets up to the, to the mountain, even when he gets to that place, Isaac asks, Father, where is the, the ram? Where is the, the lamb for the sacrifice? And how does God, or how does Abraham answer in verse number eight? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When we're living a life of faith, it's going to be scary at times because we're not going to know how exactly it's going to unfold. We're not exactly going to be able to see and have answers to what lies down that path. But Abraham says God is going to provide. I don't know exactly how it's going to shake out. I don't know exactly how it's going to transpire, but God, I am believing in You that if You have called me, that You are going to provide for me step after step after step. And so I am trusting in this. Caitlin is trusting in this. Our family is in this process of trusting God and looking to examples like Abraham that have gone before and saying, Lord, You are always faithful. You are always faithful to your people. And when we step out, when we do what God is calling us to do, even at great sacrifice, God is always faithful to provide. And of course, the story goes on that just as Abraham is there and ready to to sacrifice his only son, this miracle son, that God intervenes. Abraham, Abraham, and all of a sudden there's a ram with his horns caught in the thicket or a bush. God did provide for Abraham. And on that day, the roots of Abraham's faith went deeper and deeper and deeper into the bedrock, which is God. If you have your Bibles, please flip with me over to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. I believe not long ago, maybe a couple months ago, I shared a little bit about this um, chapter, at least on this chapter in a Thursday fireside chat. Specifically, I'm just going to to give a synopsis of the first part um, of chapter 11. But this entire chapter is committed to talking about those that have gone before us. Those that are an example in faith. Three times the author calls out examples of Abraham's faith and specifically calls out the story that we're talking about in Genesis 22. Talks about Noah. Talks about others that that we find throughout Scripture that have followed a very similar process of hearing the voice of God of hearing God call and and responding to a way that God is calling them beyond the normal, shaking things up in their life, going beyond the comfort of where they were in life and asking them to do something that's improbable. Asking them to do something that, that may not make any sense to the world or to our logic. But God is setting the stage by us doing the improbable so that He can do the impossible through us. God is calling all of us towards something that may be improbable so He can do the impossible through us. In verse 32 of Hebrews 11, it says, And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. There are all these people, all these people, all these examples throughout Scripture of people that have been walking through faith. 
Verse 33, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised to shut the mouth of lions, quench the fury of the flames, and escape the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so they may only together with us would they be made perfect. Hebrews 12, a very popular verse. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let, our fix, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. The people of the early church may have been extremely comforted by this passage because in the early church there was persecution all around. When persecution comes, the only ones that will be able to stand on that day are the ones that by faith and faith testing after faith testing after faith testing after faith testing have roots that run deep into the bedrock of Jesus. God will allow testing in our lives. And He has given us example after example of those in the faith that faced horrific things in life who faced horrific things because of their faith as I prepared this message I believe that we may possibly see in our lifetime an increased persecution for those who stand for the name of Jesus. We can choose to live a common life. We can choose decision after decision, the path of least resistance. We can choose to have safety and security at every turn. We can choose to try to lay out our lives from this day to the day that God calls us forward to have as much predictability as possible. But when the day of persecution comes, do not be surprised if you're washed away. If in the kingdom economy you are left as irrelevant, without impact, without the ability to stand firmly as an example to those that are around you now and as an example and a model to those that will come after. God wants to do uncommon things in our lives to drive us deeper and deeper 
into intimacy with him until, alas, the only thing that matters at the end of the day is Jesus Christ resurrected in and through us. That He is the one thing that our eyes are fixed upon and we look at every opportunity that God gives us as a way to step out in faith in Him and say, God, I am listening. I am open to what You're doing. And I will allow Your Holy Spirit to do whatever You need to do in me to draw me into Your presence and draw my roots deeper in You that on that day I will stand And I will stand with you. It takes an uncommon faith to stand on the day of uncommon circumstances. And I believe as the clock continues to click, I believe the circumstances of our society are going to become more and more uncommon and unfavorable for those that profess Jesus Christ. So I'll leave you with this. I believe God is calling us as a faith community to be people that have an extreme faith in Him. An extreme faith. One that may even scare people that they may think, who are these people? How are they making decisions? That our decisions would look different than what the world's convention would have to offer because God's kingdom is here. It lives in us and through us. And we follow the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And He and He alone is the one who dictates, who directs, and who orders our steps and orders our lives. And He is the only one that knows what's just beyond the horizon. He is the only one that has the foresight and the knowledge to know what's going to come our way. And so we have to trust in Him that He is preparing us today for what's going to come tomorrow. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that You would continue to challenge us forward in You. God, that You would continue to draw us forward, God, with deeper and deeper roots. God, we don't want to be common in the world's eyes. God, we want to be extraordinary in You. God, we want to be used by You. God, we want Your Holy Spirit, Lord, to live and breathe and move through us that You might have amazing impact in and through us individually and through this congregation. Lord, prepare our hearts for what is to come. That we might be listening to Your voice and sensitive, Lord, to Your prompting. God, we thank You for this day. We thank You for Your Word. In Jesus' name, Amen.